Teach us, Lord, to be masters of ourselves, that we might be the servants of others. Take our hands and work through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire. For Christ's sake. Amen. Remember, if you will, these words in Jesus' reply to Pilate. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world. Testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Friends, I begin with the happy obligation of bringing you greetings from your brothers and sisters in the Episcopal Church in Europe. You may be surprised to know that they are there, but they are there in 21 congregations spread out from Paris in the west to Tbilisi in the east. And they have already been to church this morning and are eating dinner at the time that we gather here in Memphis. So know that they are thinking of you. We have arrived today at a peculiar fixture in our calendar, the last Sunday of the church year, the Feast of Christ the King. It is a recent innovation, this feast, and it is a particularly European invitation as well, so maybe it is appropriate that the rector has arranged for you to hear from a European bishop this morning. Today's feast reached fewer than a hundred years ago. It was first celebrated in 1926, and then only in the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Pius XI instituted this feast after the catastrophe of World War I and the profound loss of belief in the Church and in the idea of faith at all that swept across Europe in the years after that calamitous war. The way the church saw it, the disaster of World War had been brought about because for the previous 500 years, the church had been gradually pushed out of the affairs of the state. There had been a time that secular power depended on spiritual authority, but that time had ended. And here is how the Pope described the result. Manifold evils in the world are due to the fact that the majority of people have thrust Jesus Christ and his holy law out of their lives, that these have no place in either private affairs or in politics, and that as long as individuals and states refuse to submit to the rule of Savior, There will be no hopeful prospect of a lasting peace among the nations. Now, we may have our own views of the words of a Catholic Pope writing almost a century ago, but as Christian people, it is hard to argue with his logic. So, the purpose of this day was intended to hold out a reminder that Jesus Christ is not only our Savior, but our Sovereign. At the very moment the Church was being pushed out of the whole business of state affairs, we put this day on the calendar to remind the world and ourselves of the Christian claim that Christ, the love of Christ, the challenge of Christ, the ideas of Christ, that is the ruler, not just of heaven, but of all the earth. You know, that was probably why in the church that I grew up in, in the middle of Michigan, built in the cinder block 1950s, there was no crucifix over the altar. Instead, there was a Christus Rex. Jesus dressed as a celebrant for the Eucharist, wearing a crown. The idea of Christ as our sovereign, that is sort of reassuring and sort of not reassuring. 
We live in times that old certainties are being called into question. Old norms are being broken. Old assumptions revealed as no longer true. The foundations seem to be shaking under our feet. There is some comfort for us in the knowledge that the Lordship of Christ stands over and above all of that, unchanging. But then, there is the reality of what that means. We are hypervigilant about the line separating church from politics. We want there to be a big, bright line that holds one apart from the other, and then on this very last Sunday of the church year, the church, on theological grounds, makes a claim that violates that boundary totally. Because this day says there is no separation. Christ is the final sovereign, not just over the kingdom of heaven, but of all the powers and principalities of this earth, too. And that means, as baptized Christians, you and me, we all hold two passports. Yes, as citizens, but also as subjects. Subjects of the kingdom of God. As citizens, we are deeply formed by the idea that the rules that govern society and the people who make and enforce those rules all have our consent to some degree or other. But as subjects, oh dear, that is a different thing entirely. The kingdom of God, that place Jesus speaks about so often to teach us about how we should live and order our common life together. The kingdom of heaven is like this, Jesus says over and over, and the kingdom of heaven is a kingdom. It is not a democracy. And in that kingdom, the operative word is not consent, brothers and sisters. It is obedience. Not a word that goes down easy for America. So what does this mean for us? How do we live as faithful followers, citizens of one realm and subjects of another? At least how do we do it with integrity and not as people with split loyalties? The first great theologian of the Anglican Church was Richard Hooker. He wrote in the 16th century, and he charted out a vision for how Anglicans would understand the relationship between the spiritual and the political. Now remember, that was no small matter in Hooker's day. In the late 16th century, every time a new ruler came into power, a lot of people who had been associated with the previous ruler, including the clergy, had a bad habit of getting executed. Hooker's basic idea was that God created us with a spiritual, a social, and a political nature. And that God intends for us to live with integrity. To live in such a way that those natures in each one of us are coherent and in harmony. You could separate the institution of the church from the state, yes. But you could not, you must not. Construct the state in such a way that it divides the spiritual from the political in the people. Our souls, with Christ as their sovereign, are meant to be the captains of our political ships and not the other way around. 350 years later, another saint, close to the heart of the church I serve in Europe, wrote about substantially the same idea, not from a rector's study, but from a Gestapo prison. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a Christian martyr who suffered imprisonment and death at the hands of a government that had taken the separation between God and government to its logical end and constructed a state that worshipped death. And maybe exactly because of that, 
Bonhoeffer argued that the governments of earth must always be seen as a part of the work of God and must always be answerable to the fundamental fact that God has reconciled each human being to himself in love through the cross and that government, to be legitimate, must follow that lead. Bonhoeffer sees government as a divine mandate, and he says this, it was precisely through the cross that Jesus won back his dominion over government. And at the end of all things, all dominion and government and power will both be abolished and preserved through Christ. So, how are we Christians supposed to navigate in a world that is increasingly brittle, increasingly polarized, increasingly harsh? God made us, and God knows us. And so God knows that we are hardwired as human beings to organize ourselves into societies and to look for leaders to follow. You might even say, together with Bonhoeffer, that we were made this way to prepare us for God's kingdom, where all of us will be followers. How are we supposed to know what ideas, what leaders to follow? Well, I don't think we get a checklist. I don't think there's a how-to video on YouTube, at least not one worth your time. But there are some important clues that the church gives us today. Ideas that are meant to help us to be shaped by the God in whom we live and move and have our being, all of our being, private and public alike. The first clue is tucked into the colic for today that the rector read at the top of the service. And especially in this description of our human condition. Remember these words? Divided and enslaved by sin. Maybe when we heard that before, we used to think that that was talking about other people. But my friends, those words were always talking about us. About all of us. And we sure feel divided these days. Now, just because so much seems to be thrown into question these days, let me say this plain. Seen from the perspective of Christ on the cross, looking down at this broken world in which we live, when people are divided between themselves, divided in their communities, divided in the nations they build, divided as a common humanity, that is a bad thing. When the culture that we create seduces us at every turn in ways that make us servants of something other than our souls, followers of influencers, rather than the God incarnate, that makes us slaves to sin. And that is a bad thing. So here's the first clue. When we are divided among ourselves, when anyone is being misled or kept down or held back from developing their full God-given potential, whenever one group of people is being set against another, that is not something faithful people are meant to follow. Those are signs of soul sickness. And as Christians, we are called to resist that path and those who want to lead us along. The second clue we get is in the Bible's account of the confrontation, and that is what it is, between Pilate and Jesus. The ground on which our whole argument stands about Christ's sovereignty over the powers of this world. And it's from that passage that I take my text this morning. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And these days, 
We ask, don't we, along with jesting Pilate, what is truth? I've recently joined a group of bishops in our church who have gathered themselves around what we sense is a need for our church to speak on theological grounds about truth, about the threats to truth that have arisen in our social media age, about the call of the church to be clear about what is and what is not truthful. Not only as a statement of fact, but as a statement of Christian belief. Friends, we are Anglicans. We have built a church on the three pillars of Scripture, tradition, and reason. And that means we begin from the position that human reason is given to us as a gift from God to reveal the truth. The truth about the universe, the truth about science, the truth about human nature, and the truth about God. That is reason's purpose. And when we fail to apply it as intended, we are falling into the devil's trap. So what is the truth that we are meant to follow? There's nothing mysterious about this, folks. It's right there on page 304 of your Book of Common Prayer. Because it's in the baptismal covenant that brought us all into the body of Christ. The truth is that God created everything that is, including us, out of love. The truth is that Jesus Christ is God incarnate. And the truth of what Jesus teaches by the lesson of his life, the example of his death, and the power of his resurrection is that we are all meant to love all people for God's sake, not just the ones we like. The truth is that all people are radically equal in the sight of God, a claim that lies at the very core of Christian faith and at the very heart of our nation's founding idea. That is our idea, not Jefferson's. And the truth is that we, each one of us, each one of us, fails to live up to that idea fully in the way we treat others. The truth is that we are all fallen. We are all frail. We all fall short of God's hope for us. We are all less wise and less righteous than we imagine ourselves to be. We all stand in need of God's forgiveness. And thank God, thank God, not one of us stands outside the reach of God's love. Not one. So, if we are both citizens and subjects, if we are not just passive observers, but faithful followers, what is expected of us is that we stand for those things. We stand for equality, even when it means we must recognize when we have benefited unequally and do something about it. We stand for love, even when the people we are called to love are people we can't really stand. And maybe most outrageous of all these days, we stand for the possibility that God enters right into the frame of our own lives still today, not just in church. That there are still moments in the lives of all people in this fallen world that are sacred. And that there is something about every human being that has value, not in the terms of this world, but eternally, because it is holy. Something that we are called to defend and to help foster in every person we meet in the little time we get here. That is the truth we are meant to seek. That is the path 
we are meant to follow, whether as citizens of a republic or subjects of the kingdom of God. We are always children of God. So don't be discouraged. I know, I know that these are challenging times. I know it. But we were baptized for challenging times. Don't be downcast. Lift up your eyes and see the King of Glory comes in. Amen.